we have vision. I want you to turn around and I want you to look at Jonathan real quick. And I want you to look at that brand new camera. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And uh, we just thank God. God blessed us with that camera. And uh, God blessed us so much, he gave us a twin, just like him. So we now have two of these uh, brand new cameras, and they're state of the art and can do everything. And um, just a miracle, not a miracle. When God honors his word, it's not a miracle. It's integrity. Amen? It's not a miracle when you believe God for something and you receive it. Amen. So it's not a miracle we got the camera. It's a, it's, a, it's a blessing of God that he allowed us to work through this wonderful process called faith. Amen. God lets us interact with him through this medium we call faith. Amen. You are never going to receive anything from God outside of what you believe. If you believe that God is your healer, you'll be healed. Let me, let, me, let me do a test real quick, okay? If I was going to get you to get somebody saved tonight, what would I need to talk about? Salvation. Salvation. If I wanted to get someone healed tonight, what would I need to talk about? If I wanted to get somebody delivered tonight, what would I need to preach about? Amen. If I wanted to get somebody some peace in their life or the fruit of the Spirit, what would I need to talk about? The fruit of the Spirit, right? If I tried to get you more money, what would I have to talk about? Interesting, isn't it? What we're preaching and teaching to you is what we're trying to get to you. Amen? When Vincent gets up and we're talking about money, all of a sudden it changes the dynamic in the room. Why is that? We have, I cannot expect you to operate in something that we haven't taught you how to operate in at least on a corporate level. So, no, tonight we're not talking about money, but I'm saying whatever it is that, you, whatever it is that we're talking about when we pray, that's what we believe that the body needs corporately in order to be whole and to operate better as a whole. Does that make sense? So tonight I want to continue on what we've been talking about the past couple of weeks um, on the testing of your faith. The testing of your faith. Is anybody taken any test lately? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, testing of your faith. Amen. It is a part of the program. You know, I'm not a rocket scientist, but uh, in order to go from third grade to the fourth grade, I had to take some tests. Amen. Third grade was the best three years of my life. I just kept failing that test and had a wonderful time. I was 17, you know, the biggest kid in the class by then. It was great. But there are testings that come, and uh, they're a healthy, normal part of the Christian life. Now, where I left off, I believe, last week was when we were talking about the difference between being tempted and being tested. And I just want to qualify a couple of things that we talked about last week, and I want to give you this scripture. Um, thank you, Lord. And I did not bring that one piece of paper with me, but you know what? That's okay. But it talks about in James that God does not tempt us with evil. Amen? Because God doesn't have any evil. Amen? There's a difference between the testing of your faith and being tempted with evil. The Satan was trying to get something from Eve. Therefore, he tempted Eve with deception in order to get something that she had. What Satan was trying to do was to provide Adam and Eve with a demotion. Whenever there's a testing of your faith, God is trying to promote you or give you a promotion. The testing of your faith is going to promote you to the next level in your life. When we fall to temptation of the flesh, Satan is inviting us for a demotion so that we go lower in his eyes. See, Satan hates us because we share the same place with Jesus. We share the same place with Jesus. Jesus is our blood brother. 
So God never tempts us with evil. Amen? Now, a lot of times, and I'm not going to say there's anybody in this room, so don't look around, but what we also have to do when it comes to the testing of our faith, I cannot tell you how many times that I have talked to people that were going through horrible things and they totally believed that it was 100% a test from the Lord. But in reality, it was just the consequences of their poor decisions. I went out, I bought this car that I couldn't afford, I financed it, I have 375 easy payments to make on this car, amen, I'm going to be making it for the rest of my life, but the car keeps breaking down and I got to put tires on it and the warranty's no good, and every time I'm looking, I'm pouring money to it. God's just testing my faith. God has nothing to do with that, amen. God, there's very, very specific things that God tests us in. And I like how my beautiful wife said it. God's not testing you as a person. He's testing to see what's in our hearts. Amen? The children of Israel wandered around the wilderness for 40 years. Amen? Because God was testing to see what was in their hearts if they were going to be able to follow His commandments. Because had they not learned how to follow God's commandments and precepts, when they went right into the promised land, they would have just gone right back into slavery. Because that's all that they knew. That whole 40 years in the wilderness, the writing of the law, all that was doing, God was having to reteach this entire group of people, having to renew their minds with this law so that they thought a different way when they went into this new land. If you take old thinking into a new land, you're going to turn that new land into the place that you used to think like. It just, that's just the nature of a person. You cannot take a man and incarcerate him and think that just total incarceration is going to change that man. Unless there's something done during that time of incarceration to change the way that man thinks, modify his behavior, he, he'll walk out the door and go right back out and do something once again. Because all incarceration does is separate him from being able to live out the lust of his flesh. Amen? We have to change the way that we think. God had to change the way that Israel thought. Amen? But first, he had to find out what was in their hearts. Now, but let's be honest. Does God already know what's in our hearts? Amen. I mean, that's like going to the Rolex guy and asking him, do you know what's inside a Rolex? Uh, yeah, I made it. I put everything in there that you see. Every spring, every notch, everything, I put it in there. Yes, I know exactly how it works. The question is, is do you? And so God will test and try our hearts, but he's not testing you as a person. Does that make sense? God does not tempt us with evil. God is not going to put a bottle of Jack Daniels in front of you when you're walking to work to see what you're going to do with that bottle of Jack Daniels. Amen? How many times does a guy show up in a strip club and he's like, well, the Lord's testing me. I'm just going to see if, I'll, I'll, if I'm going to succumb to this or not. You are, see, men think like this though, ladies. I got to be honest with you. They do. They really, really do. Men will get away with whatever you let them. They just will. It is the nature. Don't, Bill's like going, shh, shh, Jack, don't be cool. Keep that on the low, low. Ladies, inside scoop, okay? Men are pigs, okay? I'm just telling you. No, we're good. We're good men. Godly men. But unsaved men, mm. God is not going to put you in the middle of evil to tempt you with that evil. Amen? There's a testing of our faith that when I'm ready to go to the next level, there's going to be some sort of a trial where my evidence is going to be given and we're going to make enough, is there enough evidence to support what you believe? That's the testing of my faith. God asked Abraham for Isaac. There was a testing of his faith. But Abraham passed that test, and Abraham had failed some tests. Abraham had failed who his wife was test twice. Two times did Abraham tell another king that it wasn't his wife, it was his sister. 
which was a half-truth because she was a half-sister. Amen? Sarah was Abraham's half-sister, Genesis chapter 12. Amen? But two times, when he got around two kings, he told both kings that it was his sister. Abraham failed that test. You notice he had to take the test twice? You notice that he had an opportunity, he failed the test the first time, he had an opportunity to, to pass the test again? Failed it again. We're going to keep taking the test until we pass it. Amen? You're going to keep going around this mountain until we pass the test. Amen? Because only when we pass the test are we able to move on to the next level. I like Hebrews chapter 1036. And it's so funny, when you're reading the Word of God, you always see something new. There's always a phrase or something that pops out to you. And uh, this is the one I kind of want to key on tonight a little bit. But Hebrews chapter 10. It's kind of our foundational scripture for tonight. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36. For you have need of steadfast patience and endurance so that you may perform and fully accomplish the will of God and thus receive and carry away and enjoy to the full what is promised. Let me read it to you out of the King James. For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. So the thing that jumped out at me today was, number one, we have need of patience. Amen? But for me to receive the promise of God... What do I have to do? Say it. Done the will of God. That is the most important thing that dictates whether I am being tested or tempted. If I am in the middle of doing God's will, it's a test. That's how you know that my faith is being tested right now. Because I am smack dab in the middle in the will of God. And I'll show you. I'll give you some characteristics. Well, how do we know if we're in the will of God? I'm so glad you asked. Number one, this is how you know that you're in the will of God. You've believed the promise. Amen. Number two, you have obeyed the precepts. That means you've done what the word says to do. Number three, you've endured trials. And number four, you have persevered in all. So if you are walking with God, walking close to God, first and foremost, faith begins where the will of God is known. Does everybody understand that? Faith begins where the will of God is known. If you're believing God for something, the first and most important thing is you need to make sure that it's His will for you to have it. Well, how do we know it? Well, I've just heard it preached. No, no, no. You need to know chapter and verse. You are a lawyer proving a case. If you've been watching this impeachment stuff, these lawyers on both sides are brilliant. They are pleading. They are laying out a case, line upon line, precept upon precept. They know the law. Now, each side is using it to their advantage. Amen? Each one is using it to their advantage. But what they're trying to do is they're trying to lay out a case so that this group of senators are going to be able to make a judgment according to the evidence that's been given. Amen? There was a trial for there. There's a trial for our faith. So when we know that I am in the will of God, I've got to know what that promise is. Chapter and verse. I need to be able to go, it's on page 267, third paragraph. Is it God's will for you to be healed? How do you know? If you don't know the verse and you don't know the scripture, you're not standing on the word. You're mentally assenting to what you've heard preached and taught in many other places. Gonzalo's a mechanic. Amen? Right, right, Gonzalo? Do you want the guy working on your car that's gone to school and learned about the very engine that he's working on, or a guy that watched a couple of videos and went to a mechanic once and kind of saw somebody work on a car and think maybe I can do that too? 
You know, I stayed at a Holiday Inn Express last night. You know, I know exactly what I'm doing. No, no, I want somebody that knows the intricacies and the details of the vehicle that they're working on because my life depends on it. Amen? So when we say I'm standing on the Word, what does that mean? You're standing on the Word. That means you need to have scriptural proof for everything that you believe. You need to be ready to give an argument for everything that you believe. Do you believe in prosperity? Do you believe it's God's will for you to be prosperous? Then you better be able to go to chapter and verse. You better have enough evidence to back up what you believe. Amen? I, here's what the problem is sometimes, is we want to go back and start working off of others' experiences. I had this experience. I knew someone. You know, we've all done this. We've prayed for somebody that maybe was in a life and death situation, and maybe they, they died. Amen. But we prayed for him. So you go to pray for the next person and we stand on the word and we speak the word. But this person says, well, my experience last time was is that we prayed and it didn't work. So now all of a sudden we're living off the experience of someone else and not going back. Does the word work? Yes. Does it work every time? Yes. It's like gravity. It will work for anybody that gets involved with it. Amen. Can I give you just a little nugget, a sidetrack real quick? This is very, very important. If you, have been, if you are standing and you are believing for someone or something, and maybe you're questioning why is this taking so long. Has anybody ever questioned why it's taking so long? You know, like I said before, nobody's ever come in on a Sunday morning and said, God bless me too fast. I mean, that thing that I was believing for, it got here too fast. I don't know what to do. I've never heard that testimony from anybody at any time. Amen? Because it's, where it's the testing of our faith. But this is something that God showed me. Check your love walk. If something's not happening for you the way that you think it should, and you're standing on the Word, and you feel like you're doing everything that you're supposed to be doing, I would go back and recheck my love walk. Am I walking in love with everybody? Am I walking in any unforgiveness with anybody? Amen. What I want to do is I want to constantly keep myself free from any impediment that's going to clog up my faith pipe, which I'm receiving from. So I want to constantly, like, do you, faith should never feel mechanical. Faith should never depress you. You know what I mean? When we, when you, when we have an opportunity to use our faith, we should be like, praise God, it's an opportunity to grow. For me and God to do something together. It should never be, well, we need X, Y, and Z, and we're going to have to use our faith. Oh, gosh, again. Has it come to that? Faith is a wonderful thing, and there should be some joy and some miraculous power attached to whatever or whomever you're believing for. Amen? There should be an excitement. When Michelle and I met, there was some miracle working power at place. We had both been believing God for each other, how God supernaturally put us together. Only he could have done it. Only God could have done it. We didn't go on an online service to find each other. God was smarter than the computer. Amen? He led us together. When we talk about how we met and how we got married and how God brought her from Anaheim, California, I'm sorry, Calabasas, where that crash took place. That's where Michelle came from, from California in Calabasas, where Kobe Bryant's helicopter crashed and I came from Houston Texas and we met in a Bible school and God supernaturally put us together 24 25 almost 25 years ago amen it was by faith amen there has to be some there was some joy in it there was something miraculous in it we should be excited about what we're believing for it should bring you joy Amen. It shouldn't be this hard drudging, just this labor of, oh gosh, I'm believing God. It, we, we never, it's like marriage. I never want my marriage just to turn into some of like a um, partnership 2.0. I want my marriage to be full of romance. I want my, my marriage to be full of intimacy. I want my marriage to be full of fun. Amen. She's like, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> I don't want a roommate. I don't want two people that just share the same house and pass each other going by. That's mechanical. That's just going through the motions. Amen? 
So, um, when we are being tested in our faith, we can say that number one, we've exercised our patience, we have evidenced our confidence, and we have finished our work. Amen? We have finished our work. The testing of your faith, and I always want to jump right to the end because I think it's so cool, but it's vital that each and every one of us be using our faith on a daily basis for someone or something. Plain and simple. That is the only way to grow or mature in the things of God is by using your faith. There's no other way to grow. There's no other way to grow in the body. Just coming to church, having a perfect church attendance, it's wonderful, but if you haven't grown spiritually in any of that time that you've been coming to church, you haven't matured as a believer. A mature believer is not measured by how many years they've served the Lord. A mature believer is used by how they have used their faith and how God has promoted and used that person. See, because once you learn to, t to believe God for your needs, now you can believe God for other people's needs. Now that you've used your faith to get one person saved, now you can use your faith to believe to get 100 people saved. Once you've used your faith to get 100 people saved, now you can learn how to believe for a city. Then you can learn how to believe for a country. Do you see what I'm saying? Do you see how it's constantly growing? Our faith is to be growing and doubling all the time. I should never, ever get to the place where I'm comfortable. I should never get to the place where I sit back on my blessed assurance and say, whew, I finally believe God for all the things that I need. I don't have to use my faith anymore. It is something that we're going to be using from now into eternity. It is God's medium. It is His it is his preferred way of his relationship with his children. There's not one thing. How many of you believe that God loves you? How many of you believe that God loves you? Do you really believe that God loves you? Do you believe it? You know it without a shadow of a doubt. You know it. How do you know it? Don't say it because I feel it. How do you know? Right. He says it in his word but it witnesses in your spirit. You know it in here. That's faith. That same faith that you just used to know that God loves you is the same faith that you're going to use to help get your kids a car or put them through college or heal your body. It's the same faith. It's the same belief in the same God doing the same things that he did for everybody else in the Bible that ever believed him. He's no respecter of persons. Amen? If God did it for one person, he'll do it for you. Amen? If God did it for one person, he'll do it for you. But we have to do it God's way. Amen? I can't, I can't try and live a little faith, a little flesh. A little faith, a little flesh. I can't pick and choose what I use my faith on. I'm going to use my faith for, for finances and for growth, but I'm not going to use my faith for health and healing. I'm just going to go to the doctor every time. You're, you're double-minded in what you think. No, I'm not saying don't go to doctors. If You do what God tells you to. Amen? Going to a doctor is still leading towards health and healing. Amen? So that's a logical step. So I'm not saying don't go to the doctor. But we have to become so proficient in our faith, like I have a strong faith for protection for my wife, for my children. Amen? But I maybe need to build my faith in some other areas but it's the same faith. This is good. When you drive home and you're alone, you're going to roll down the window and yell because you're going to understand that you can have and go and do anything that you want and anything that you need. It's right there if you'll just dare to believe. You don't have to wait. This isn't a hard work that, oh my gosh, 20 and 50 years and I'm going to struggle and, and all that. No, no, no. Your victory is as close as you just believing right now. I believe right now. Now. Faith is. Faith is. What's the verse? Faith is. Faith is. Go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. 
It's a three-letter word. Faith is now. Faith is now. All together. Faith is Faith is now. Thank you. <laughs> Faith is not tomorrow. Faith is not yesterday. Faith is always now. I believe that I receive now. I don't believe I receive tomorrow. I believe that I receive now. If you had a debilitating disease and you were believing God... Would you keep pushing it off till tomorrow? Well, I'll believe I'll be healed tomorrow. Tomorrow never comes. It's always today. It's always today. I don't know where we're going with this, but I'm having a ball right now. <laughs> Faith is now. So when I believe that I receive, I'm not waiting to receive. I am believing that I have already taken ownership of it now. And when you choose to live that life of faith, there are going to be tests to prove what you're really putting your faith in. Amen? There are going to be tests so that you know exactly what you're putting your faith in. Hebrews chapter 10, 36. Let me just read the whole thing again. For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Listen to me. Patience and trust can only be proven over time. Patience and trust can only be proven over time. I've been married faithfully to Michelle for, it'll be 24 years in September. Amen? I've faithfully been married. Have I been faithful to Michelle? This isn't a trick question. You can say yes. <laughs> yeah? But 24 years in the frame of 100 years, have I really proven myself faithful? I can t I'm continually proving myself faithful in my marriage to Michelle. We will be married till we're both holding hands and raptured together, or we're both our shells are buried next to each other in a cemetery. We will be married. I will be true to her for the rest of my life. That takes trust. That trust and that patience is built over a lifetime. Amen? This is why it's so important to live by faith. The things that faith produces, this trust and this patience and this endurance, these are the things that will, you will take with you into eternity. These are the things that really life is made of and why we're even here. If you're not living by faith, if you're not learning to trust God in every area of your life, then I'm not maturing in those areas. And what God is wanting us to do, the purpose of this whole thing is to mature us. He wants to mature you. And what, this is what time is for. This seen realm is the only place where there's time. I heard, I think it was Billy Brim say that God reached up into eternity and he cut out a piece and he put it on the earth and he called it time. This is the only place where time exists. There's no time in heaven. I heard someone say that when it's time and if the Lord should tarry and we get to walk into glory and this body dies and our spirit ascends, that you're going to see people that have gone 10, 20, 50, 100 years before you, but you're all just kind of walking in at the same time. Does that make sense? They just got there. Maybe you're 50 years behind them. Maybe that was your mom or your dad, or maybe it was 80 or 100 years or whatever, but you're just, y'all are just, you just kind of walking in just behind them because there's no time there. There's only time here. The reason that there's time here is because that's what we need as humans to prove, develop endurance and patience. Does everybody love talking about patience? Why weren't we just born with it? Was any, does anybody know any babies that were born patient? <laughs> huh? Babies are wonderful and beautiful. And they're great and you look at them and they're wonderful and they're just so innocent and full of love. But if you don't feed them and you don't change them, 
and you don't burp them and you don't do all that stuff, they get real impatient real fast. Kind of like some men that I know. No, that, no, no, no. Amen? Listen to me, parents. One of the most vital things that you can impart to your children, a number one thing that you can impart to your children is patience. And patience can only be developed by one word, no. If you don't ever tell your children no, and they get whatever they want, whenever they want it, or whenever they cry for it, or whenever they throw a fit for it, you are not preparing them for later life because they are not developing any patience. They have no endurance. They don't know how to handle it. So one of the greatest things that we can do as parents is to teach our kids patience. We teach our kids patience through the word no. Now that doesn't mean, mommy, can I have a drink of water? No. It means that we have to be the adult and when their flesh is rearing up and they're wanting everything when they want it, that we as that parent who have been there before, because we were all just like them, when I say no, then that child has to, by nature, stop and learn to be patient for what they're asking for. Amen? Patience is a godly characteristic. It is from God himself. God is the most patient being this world has ever seen. Well, how do you know that? Because I know me. If I were God, I would have been vaporized years ago. But God is so patient and kind, and he moves slowly with us. Amen? He learns patience, but it is something that we as believers, we have to develop and we have to pass down. Amen? We have to be patient. Well, why is that, Pastor Jack? Because if you get put into a crisis situation and you have no formal training, you're going to hurt yourself and everybody else that's around you. William, what happens in a panic situation? Who's the one that lives? The one that's disciplined, the one that is patient under tribulation so that when the attack comes, he has learned through patience and endurance and steadfastness not to let his emotions run away with him, but to remain cool, calm, and collective in the midst of tribulation and therefore being able to defeat whatever is coming at him or anybody else. Amen? We can't go boo every time the lights get turned on because we get spooked by something. We have to learn to be patient in our spirits. Jesus was so patient in his spirit. I never saw him lose his patience. I guess the closest he would come was he would call them, oh, ye of little faith. How long do I have to dwell with you? Look in the Bible and see how many times Jesus made this statement. And again, I say. And again, I say. And again, I say. He's like a parent talking to children. And again, I say. Okay, Luke, you need to make up your bed, take your wet towel, in the bathroom, clean down the bathroom, do all that stuff, and every time. Okay, it wasn't done. Okay, and again I say Luke. And again, Jack, Luke, do this, do that. They don't do it, then there's a consequence. And again I say. I'm hitting some nerves with some parents right now, huh? Amen? And again I say. That's what Jesus did. And again I say, and again I say, and again I say. He was constantly trying to impart into his, to his disciples the peace that he carried under every situation. Jesus was never surprised by anything except when people acted in faith. He'd be like, wow, I haven't seen faith like that in all of Israel. You just blew me away. That is so cool. You totally just got me. You're not even a Jew. You're a Gentile. You're a centurion. You just wanted, you understand how this thing works? Poof, you got me. That's how you surprise Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Is anybody being tested in your faith? Amen. 
we all are, and it's, the, it's a good thing. It is how we grow. Um, it took years for Abraham to go from trusting God and leaving the comfort of his home to when he went to sacrifice Isaac. This is the numbers that I did. Abraham, when God called him, was 75 years old. Amen? 75 years old, God calls him. Some of the writers say it took about five years for Abraham to finally do what God told him to do. Five years. By the time he left and did the first thing that God told him to do, till the time when he went to sacrifice Isaac, Abraham. Do you know how old Isaac was? How old do you think Isaac was when he went to sacrifice him? Twelve. Twelve. Come on, Sandy. You're feeling it. There's no wrong numbers here because none of us were there, were we? Yeah, if you do the math and you look, Sarah, he was 37 years old. 37 years old is what the rabbinical, the rabbis put together because they look at Sarah, how old she was when she weaned him and all this. They did all the math or whatever. They said he was 37 years old. He had to be strong enough. He had the wood on his back when he carried it up Mount Moriah. So he wasn't a child. I mean, he had to be strong enough to do it. And there's a whole nother sermon there. But so that means Abraham was 137 years old when he offered Isaac. 75 years, and he wondered, and he, he, he five years, and he teetered with God, telling him what to do, and battled with should he leave, and if he should leave, should he take Lot with him, all that, to now that he's 137 years old, and God says, give me your very best, give me Isaac. And, I, and Abraham immediately did what God told him to do. See, it takes a lifetime You're not going to get to that level of faith overnight. I believe that what God was doing with Abraham was that they were both spending all of that time learning about each other. As much as as God needed to learn to trust Abraham, Abraham had to learn how to trust God. That's what time's for. We have time to spend with God. We have time to give him our best. We have time to develop that relationship with him. That's what time is for. There's nothing good that comes out of quick growth, instant money, winning the lottery, all this quick fix, quick money, quick thing, quick growth, whatever. It's the worst thing in the world that can ever happen to you. It is a slow, steady Line upon line, precept upon precept, growth that produces maturity. It's not quick growth. Now what's funny is, is you can walk with God for year after year after year after year after year, and then all of a sudden you step into a suddenly. But even that suddenly took 50 years to get you to the point where you were ready for that suddenly. It's like the people that come up, the singer goes on the Grammys, just won the song. They're like, man, where have you been? You were just, you were famous overnight. And they were like, you have no idea how long a night this has been. That I've been struggling, that I've been hauling my own equipment around and traveling in an old car and nobody wanted to hear my music and and I was taken advantage of and all that. That's the overnight. Amen. Amen. Quick growth is not from God. God is about maturing us as believers. And one of the primary ways that we mature is the testing of our faith because it produces patience. Isn't it cool that it says, and let patience, and we're talking now about James, verses 1, 2, and 3, count it all joy. Why do you count it all joy? We talked about it last week. Number one, we know that he's in there with us. And we know, number two, that this is an opportunity to grow. Count it all joy when we fall into various trials and temptations, knowing that the testing of our faith produces patience. And let patience have her. Calls it a her. Her. It's a good question. Her. Let patience have her perfect work with you. 
If you've ever been in a relationship, you've got to have patience. Every marriage relationship, there has to be patience. Has to be. If you're not patient, if I'm not patient with Michelle, if she's not patient with me, we're not going to stay married real long. We have to learn to be patient with each other. If you want to develop patience, start at home. Just start at home. That's the number one place that you will develop it is with your spouse. You will learn to be patient with one another. But let patience have her perfect work with you so that you may be perfect and complete and lacking nothing. Amen? And another word for that for perfect is mature. There's no other way to grow in the things of God unless I use my faith, I stand over a period of time, and I mature in the things of God. Amen? Good stuff? Yes. I've not even looked at my notes yet. But it's been amazing. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let's just pray for a minute. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for the word of God that is both quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Father, we thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you're maturing us. Thank you, Lord, that you're taking us from faith to faith. Thank you, Lord, that you're moving us from glory to glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father. You're so good to us. Praise you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, one of the definitions for that word mature is um, it's the same word they use. Remember the, the old pirate movies where they would pull out that telescopic looking glass? That's maturing. Each part pulls out on top of the other part and gets bigger as it grows. It's maturing. The farther it gets away to the end, it matures. That's what God is wanting for us. But the only way that we can mature is line upon line, precept upon precept. There are all kinds of stories of people that skipped first through fifth grade and went to college and were brilliant. That's not normal, is it? Most of us went to kindergarten three and four times, like me. Everybody else? No. But there's an order to our education of kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade. Why is that? Because we keep reinforcing our foundation so that when new growth comes, I'll be able to hold on to it and withstand it. If I get going too fast, then I'm on shaky ground because I don't have enough of a foundation yet to be able to build on. See, and here, here's the point, is God is wanting to build onto your house tonight. He's wanting to build onto your house right now, but you have to make sure that that foundation is strong enough so that when he does build on it, it's going to be a strengthening, empowering thing, and it's not going to be a disastrous, crashing thing. That's why it's so important for us to be growing and developing and walking and learning and living by faith. Amen? Let's stand up. Hallelujah. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, absolutely. Why don't you grab a mic? Uh, we're going to pray over this coronavirus we're going to, um, we're going to, we're going to use our faith, but we're going to put a bloodline, we're going to put a restraining order. Yeah. Amen. Anybody familiar with that term? We're going to put a restraining order on that virus. Davy, is you traveling? Are you traveling a lot still? Amen. We're going to pray over you and those that are traveling internationally. Anybody else traveling internationally? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Well, it helps us to build our trust that God does heal. So I'm just going to speak. Thank you, God, Thank that you, your Lord. word promises things. And you are not a man that you should lie. You cannot lie. Those mm. are both promises. And you said, by the stripes Jesus bore, we were made whole. You said you sent your word and healed us. You said you wish above all things that we prosper and be in health even as our soul prospers. You said that you will restore health to us and heal us of all our wounds. And you said you are the God who healeth. You take sickness out of our midst and you bless our bread and water. 
So I speak directly to this coronavirus yes. that has come out of China from in the, the web market. In the name markets, of Jesus. And I curse the power of it continuing to spread, especially in America, in the name of Jesus, or for anyone that loves you and serves you, Lord, they go. I command the virus to bow its knee, disintegrate, disappear, and not touch Hallelujah. anyone Thank that you is Lord. serving you especially, but just disappear on behalf of all the people of the world. It is not a virus that has... Lord, but there is nothing too hard for you, the word says. There is nothing too wonderful for you. There was no disease that you could not cure. You, you healed everyone that came to you and believed you. So I am believing you for a hedge of protection yes. over the people here at West Houston Christian Center, Hallelujah. over the Christians of the world, over the United States of yes. America. I plead the blood of Jesus over all the West Houston Christian Center attendees, members, and... Um, just sisters and brothers in Christ. Yes. I plead the blood over you. I loose angels to surround, minister, protect, do warfare in the heavenlies against the things we can and cannot see and destroy every attack of the enemy against you. But specifically with this virus, it cannot touch you. I command your immune system is to be strong and the same resurrection that rose Jesus from the dead being inside you will push out, push away and cause to disintegrate anything that comes against you. I command your and speak that your immune systems are strong enough to fight out any bacteria bacteria, any virus, any colds, any symptoms, any allergies, and especially this coronavirus in the name of Jesus. Yes. By the name of in Jesus, the, name the of coronavirus Jesus. has no power over us. We speak that we have power and authority over all the power of the enemy. Sickness comes from the enemy. Coronavirus, we break your power. We uproot you. We command you to disintegrate and stop spreading in the name of Jesus. And once again, I plead the blood over the people of West Houston and over America. We draw a bloodline around America, and we say, you cannot come into this country, and you cannot travel with people coming into this country, and you cannot harm the people of God in the world, Hallelujah. in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. That's good. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you for your protection over each and every one of us, Lord. Hallelujah. If you're believing for finances, just raise up your hands real quick. Thank you, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I just pray, Father, right now, Lord, I'm asking you to open doors and open windows. I'm asking you, Father, to align footsteps. Lord, I'm saying and I'm seeing, Lord, anything that's been stolen from any person in this room in the name of Jesus must be returned. Whether that is land, whether that is an inheritance, is that property, if that's a vehicle, if there are heirlooms, if it's a heritage or a legacy, whatever those things are, Father, I just speak that they're being returned right now in the name of Jesus to their rightful owners. I thank you, Lord, for jobs right now. now and Lord, not just jobs, Father, but, but, but ministry and opportunities, Lord. Being in that divine blessing where you have called and empowered us to be. I thank you, Lord, that you're increasing us, that we have vision Lord, for outreach, we have vision to do the Great Commission. And that, uh, Lord, I just call it in, and I believe that I receive it in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Just a reminder, um, the four things that we're really working on, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, is our foundational scripture this year. Looking unto Jesus. If you want to know what your faith is based on, we're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We're reading our Bible Monday through Friday, we're in the book of Matthew. Fun, great stuff in the book of Matthew. Amen? Number two, we're being doers of the word. We're doing the Great Commission. we got all kinds of outreach opportunities. Invite somebody to church. Number three, through our gifts, our tithes, and our offerings, we are purposed to be a tither and a giver. We're sowing on purpose. A farmer sows on purpose. We are sowing on purpose, believing for a harvest. And number four, we're finding out where we fit in the body as part of a serve team. Amen? Amen. God bless you. We love you. Jesus is Lord. We'll see you Sunday morning.